my friends! Today is the day. It is stats, favorites, and disappointments day. Yes, I am fairly certain that you are being inundated with people's favorite books of the year, least favorite books of the year, a yearly stats video. What did Jessica decide to do? Throw them all in the same video. In the vein of trying to do only 25% this year, I didn't want to film three separate videos. A, because that's three intros and three outros that I just don't need to do. I mean, one of each for sure, but three is excessive. So we're just gonna do this long ass video style and I will be putting uh, links in the description box and the chapters in. So if you want to go to one specific part, you can go to that. We're just gonna wrap up the whole year right here, you and me. Let's get to it. First thing I wanna talk about is like some basic library stats, which if you're looking at my library currently, it a mess y'all. Um, I have so many books pulled down, so many that are I'm unhauling a lot. Like it's, it's crazy. It's a hot dang mess. So I need to film these uh, like next six or seven videos so that I can get my shelves reorganized. I'm going to do a full shelf reorganization. Probably will not film that because that's too much energy and excess. And I've did like three of them last year. So if you need to see one, there's plenty of backlog. Okay. So in my library, I currently own 543 books, which is a lot, but you know, probably median for what you see on booktube. 543 is probably median of what we see on booktube. My percentage of unread books, which I'm very, very proud of, is 20.8%. That means I have read more than three quarters of the books on my shelves and that is quite fantastic really uh, considering I have over a hundred unread books. I mean of course that maths out but it just when you're looking at a hundred read unread books you're like wow I have a lot of books I haven't read but in comparison to read books it's actually not terrible. Um, I would like to never ever ever be more than 25% unread. But you know, we're just gonna see how life goes, I guess. So let's get into the year of 2021. What did we do? Well, we read 130 books. And by we, I mean me and my brain because you weren't there. I mean, you might've been. Some of you actually might've been. Uh, but I read 130 books and it was a total of 43,714 pages. Oh, which is a lot. Uh, if you see me look down, I'm looking at my phone because numbers are hard to remember in here. So they're in front of me. I will be showing you some charts, some graphs, some fun things. I don't know if they're going to be here, 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 here. I don't know where they are on the screen, but they should be here somewhere. Okay. If we look at how many books I read per month, my high months were February, March, and October. February and October is totally normal. For some reason, February is almost always my highest reading month. Don't know why. And I always try to read 31 books in October. So that tracks. I will note, I did do this by page count rather than by book number. Had I done it by book number, I think June would have been in second because I read a whole bunch of short mid grades for the Summer Scare Readathon. But by page number, it's February, March, October. And my low months this year were September, November, December. I think that also is different if I do it by page count versus book number. So I did do it by page count. And November is probably the lowest reading month I've ever had at three books. And it was a weird month. It was a very weird month. And I haven't really picked anything up for a few weeks. Um, I just haven't really been in a reading mood. So we'll see how 2022 goes. As we go forward talking about um, stats of different books, like when I purchased them, when, um, you know, where they were purchased, what year, that there, there's a lot of stats that we are gonna talk about. I do want to like be forward and say that I did do some rereading this year. Um, I think I reread 
12 or 16 books. I don't remember the exact number. We'll get to that eventually. Um, 17. I can see it from here. I reread 17 books this year and for a lot of my stats I don't include those in the stats because I don't need to keep track of like how long a book sat on my shelf unread if I've already read it. You know what I mean? So if you see any of these and they don't add up to 130 that's probably why. Also ARCs can finagle with that as well so do with that information what you will. So our next chart is were these books on my TBR, my physical TBR at that. The number is hilarious. So I did 65 books off of my physical TBR which is exactly 50%. Exactly 50% of the books I read this year came off of my physical TBR. That's hilarious in my opinion. I don't know. You might not find it as funny but I found it quite entertaining. 29 were library borrows, 17 were rereads, and 15 were arcs. No, that's a lie. 19 were arcs. 19 arcs. Whew, that's a lot. I didn't think I'd read that many this year, but apparently I have. That's a lot of books, y'all. So when were those books purchased? Again, this wouldn't include arcs because I never bought them. So basically, these are just of the 65 that are on my physical TBR. 28 of them were purchased in 2021, 17 were purchased in 2020, 3 were purchased in 2019, and 12 were purchased in 2018, which means I did a really fantastic job of prioritizing 2020 and 2021 books this last year, um, trying to get to the newer releases in a timely fashion, and I did a pretty damn good job. In the same vein, looking at when these books were published, um, and this one did include ARCs, uh, 40 were published in 2021, 24 were published in 2020, 11 were published in 2019, and 12 were pu published in 2018. There's some other numbers in there that you'll see on the chart, but those are like the major tentpole years. 59.6% uh, of everything that I read this year was published in the last two years. So again, I think I did a really good job of prioritizing things that were newer releases, which in the past I've read almost predominantly further backlist titles. So uh, I know ARCs are definitely a big chunk of that, um, but I'm also prioritizing things that I'm buying. Uh, genres, as you can see, there's a whole shit ton of genres. Um, I would say the highest genre that I read uh, would be fantasy. and. I, in my chart, split those up, fantasy, high fantasy, and urban fantasy, but of all of the fantasies, 39 books were fantasy. Uh, 26 were paranormal, which most people would consider paranormal part of fantasy, but I have this weird division in my brain that gives them different definitions. I don't really know if that's a real thing, but it, it, it it's in here. So uh, 26 were paranormal. Did I say 29? I don't know. It's 26 either way. And then I also smushed together for these numbers contemporary and romance uh, because most of the romance books that I read are contemporary. Um, so I went ahead and smushed them together for the sake of me telling you numbers. But contemporary romance was 31 books, which is about normal for me. Let's talk ratings, shall we? Most books this year, I gave a 4.25 out of 5 stars. That was 17.3% were 4.25 stars. And the second most used rating that I gave out was 3.75 at 14.2%. Interesting. Um, the thing that I love, I mean, I read some really questionable, questionable books this year, um, as far as like my opinion and things that just, um, not counting DNFs because I do not rate DNFs. Um, because I don't feel like it's fair to rate something I did not read in its entirety, even if it's a piece of utter garbage dumpster fire. Um, my average rating this year was 3.9%, which is fantastic, really, when you think about it. Um, I'm very happy with a 3.9, like super happy with a 3.9. I think that means that I had a really good reading year. So, I mean, I read a lot. I read a lot of things I loved. Um, I got a lot of like really favorite of all time books this year. So um, I'm calling this year like a total win. Age group, if you look at this chart, you can tell that I basically read a shit ton of YA uh, at 63.8%. Did a lot of YA end up in my favorites of the year? Keep watching and you'll find out. 
Uh, the next one that we will tackle is most read authors. Um, the interesting thing is only one of these authors was not having any rereads. So my most read author was Susan Dennard with five books because I reread the entirety of the Witchland series plus read the new release Witch Shadow. Um, four books each were Maureen Johnson and Rachel Hawkins slash Aaron Sterling because it's the same author. Um, just a pen name. Three books each we had Mercedes Lackey, Madeline Rue, and Crystal Sutherland. Madeline Rue was the only one that was not any rereads. Um, Susan Denner was one new one, Maureen Johnson was one new one, Rachel Hawkins, Aaron Sterling was one new one, Mercedes Lackey was all rereads, Crystal Sutherland was one new one, Madeline Rue, all new. I mean, new to me, there. It's, it's a seriously backlisted book series, but new to me at least. And the last one that we're going to talk about um, before we get into books acquired versus books read is my most read publisher. There is a large chunk in there, like the biggest chunk of the pie is all of the indie presses smushed together. Because as you can tell, there's like a whole shit ton of um, different publishers. And at one point, I just, if I got lost trying to figure out who the indie publisher was or who they were connected to or whatever, I got lost. I just would put them in indie publisher and move on with my life because I it's, it's not that scientific, people. Um, it is what it is. Um, my highest book count would be Little Brown at 12. And then Wednesday Books at 10. Nobody is surprised. And Tor at 7. Again, nobody's surprised because I think all five of Susan Dennard's books are Tor. So there's definitely some others that have some higher numbers, but those are the, the highest ones for sure. I do like looking at publisher because I enjoy like seeing what publishers are publishing books that I like. I didn't realize I like Wednesday Books line so much until last year when I started tracking this and I was like I read a shit ton of Wednesday Books and I've really liked most of them. Um, Little Brown was um, a big one on books that I reread this year. A lot of them were those and again Tor was a lot of rereads as well but maybe in the future I won't log the publisher for rereads. That's an idea. Note to self. And finally, our last little chart that we're going to look at is acquisition purchases for clarity. So much like last year, um, we talked about this in our stats video. I very much do kind of harp on you guys as much as possible to purchase from indie bookstores or bookshop.org or Libro FM or someplace that is not Amazon or Walmart or like a big box store um, and really support our, our smaller industry people who are actually there for us and not just people that are trying to make as much money off of us as humanly possible. And because I do that preaching to y'all, I also feel like it's good for me to kind of give you an overview of where I did end up purchasing my books from. So the large ones that we're going to look at here is Wheatberry Books at 12 books. That is my local indie. Um, so I have 12 books from my local indie. From other indie bookstores I have 11. Um, of those 11 I know that some of them are bookshop.org. I know that some are Malaprops. Some are um, Susan Dennard's local indie that I can't think the name of right now but I should know because it's I buy books from them all the time. There were some books that I pre-ordered this year um, and whenever you know the author was saying hey pre-order from my local indie I did that as much as I could. So I did order a lot of books from indies and um, whether it was my local or a different local. 11 books came from Owlcrate. 11 were gifts so I do not know where they were purchased because it is not <laughs> It's not appropriate to uh, grill people and ask them where they bought the books that they gifted you, in case you're wondering. And 10 came from Amazon. So I'm, I'm not saying I don't ever buy books from Amazon. I just don't buy them from there as often as I used to. Um, I do try to make it less than 25% of my intake and I do believe it was this year. So I think it was a pretty small percentage of my intake this year actually. Um, but you can see that on the chart that I can't currently see. Those are all the stats. We're going to move into favorites and disappointments and we're going to start off with 
Do you want to do favorites of the year first or biggest disappointments of the year first? Disappointments? And then on a high note? Let's do that. One thing I want to clarify. These are not the worst books of the year. These are not the worst books that I've read. Some of them were the worst, worst books that I read, but they're not all the worst books that I read this year. These are the biggest disappointments. So these are books that I thought were going to be fantastic that I ended up not enjoying as much. Some of these books might have gotten like a three or a three and a half star rating, which is totally normal and fine, but that doesn't mean that's what I was expecting. So biggest disappointments, not worst books. Cool? Cool. Also, I did these in alphabetical order rather than in like list of least hated to most hated. It, it's just in alphabetical order and my favorites are the same way. They're also in alphabetical order because don't make me pick a favorite of the year. It's not happening. So the first is A Song of Wraiths and Ruins by Roseanne A. Brown. I have heard so many people hype this book up and I have seen so many people really love this book and it just did not work for me. I honestly could not tell you at this exact moment in time what about it didn't work for me. I read it in June and I I know that like the plot didn't make a whole lot of sense and there was just like some weird things and I didn't buy the love interest. It was like a weird like love at first sight. They'd only seen each other like twice the entire book but they were in love with each other and there was just like this whole other thing going on and I just I have zero interest in picking up the sequel and I was very let down by this book and this gorgeous cover. Beyond the Ruby Veil by Mara Fitzgerald. I got this last year um, when it came out and did not pick it up until this year. I kind of sort of hated this one a little bit. I didn't dislike our main character. I just thought that the book was too short and it didn't really make a whole lot of sense. There's a lot of weird things going on and it just like didn't really explain things in a way that I liked and I hated the way that the main character treated her fiance and I mean other people as well but just there was some it just it did not work for me. Again I read this very early on this year and I don't apparently wood has been brought in. Um, I read this earlier this year so I don't really remember a whole lot about what I didn't like about it but I know that it just I expected so much because I knew that it was dark and I knew that it had like a prickly heroine which doesn't typically bother me and I know that like there was a lot of good things it had going for it but I don't know that the execution really worked for me. Uh, the next one I've already unhauled and that is Circe by Madeline Miller. I actually DNF'd that. Um, I It was boring and I didn't like it and I'm not here for it. Ow. Let's move on. Instant Karma by Marissa Meyer. Um, this I expected this to be a five star. Like I love Marissa Meyer. Her books are fantastic. I did not like this. I hated the main character which apparently is a thing for me now that I am looking at this. Okay. Um, I did not like the main character. I think she was very self-absorbed, very selfish and I feel like in, the, in a book the point is for the main character to change as time goes on and I don't feel like it did that. And I also have a lot of questions about the like there's just there was just some things that happened and like the process of how any of this could have actually happened. There was a lot of like weird shady shit going on that I don't understand how it could have happened and but whatever and then there was magical stuff kind of there sort of but not really and I despite the fact that it's you know is very heavily reliant upon this whole theme of there being a like animal marine life shelter where they're protecting all this marine life I know someone who has specifically worked in that type of an environment who has told me that like basically none of that is how any of that actually happens in these places and so it's just there's a lot of things about this book that didn't work for me and didn't work for other people and I was very let down by it and I kind of expected that going in because by the time I had started to pick this up I was already hearing that other people hated it and but I, I still was disappointed. If you are surprised to see this next book then you have not been on my channel for very long. Lore by Alexander Bracken. I was promised, I was promised a Medusa book. I mean, look at it. It's fucking Medusa. I don't know if you know this about me, but I la 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 love Medusa. We're actually gonna talk about that a little bit later in the video. I, I don't even understand what this was. Like it, I mean, I, I know theoretically what it was. It was like a book where they, the families that 
had at some point like angered the gods and there was like a there was demigods within them or gods within them and then every year they would like kind of have like a hunger game situation where they would all try to like kill each other's family members and shit and do all these things and this girl was like the last person in her family and she was like in hiding and doing something there was some shit going on in here like some espionage and just which sure okay but it was very predictable very boring and none of the like mythology part of it made any damn sense and there was the weird love interest thing that just like came in at the last buzzer like you're just like sailing the whole time and all of a sudden like let's just make out on a rooftop that made no fucking sense and I I'm I'm unhauling this if that tells you any indication how I felt about this book it looks like this and I'm unhauling it so clearly did not enjoy also if you want to know like more of my full thoughts on lore and why I hated it I do have like a a wrap-up where I, I very severely ranted about it and I'll link that down below anyway moving on uh <laughs> Lost in the Neverwoods by Aiden Thomas I was let down by this book because I read Aiden's debut last year which was Cemetery Boys which I have since found out that he actually wrote this book before Cemetery Boys and they just released them in that order which is fine but I walked into this not knowing that it was a Peter Pan retelling and I think if I had known that I probably wouldn't have picked it up despite the fact that it's fucking gorgeous. I don't hate this one like I'm not this one I'm keeping I'm not unhauling it it's okay it just was not what I was expecting after Cemetery Boys. Like Cemetery Boys was fucking fantastic. One of my favorite books of all time. And this was just meh. It was alright. I don't really like it. I don't really know what it was trying to do or what the point was or I mean it deals with some very serious trauma and things that happened that should not have happened and I mean there's a lot that happens in this book. I mean it does have points but I'm but yeah, it, it, it just, it, it didn't make me very happy. Okay, moving on. Another one that I have already unhauled because I DNF'd it, Ninth House by Lee Bardugo. I tried to read Ninth House and I didn't like it. And I, I'm, I was like 30% in and I just didn't care about anything that was happening. And so I DNF'd and unhauled it. So I was expecting a lot because everybody on booktube was like, it's fantastic, it's wonderful, it's lovely, it's blah, 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 blah. I didn't like it and I unhauled it, I DNF'd it, let's move on. Not a Happy Family by Sherry LaPena. I read this in October, it was terrible, I hated it, I actually already unhauled it, well I didn't actually unhaul it, like in a video, I just threw it in the bag of unhauled books that are going out the door and never told you I was unhauling it. Um, this is about an entire family of fucking idiots and they're all stupid and I hate them all. And honestly, like the parents are murdered and I did not give two shits about who had killed the parents or why because they were terrible people and they deserve to die. That's all I have to say. Uh, next is Spells Trouble by PC and Kristen Cast. I did finish reading that one. It was an arc that I had. I don't know if you know this, PC and Kristen Cast wrote the House of Night series, which a lot of people don't really enjoy. I personally loved I have a tattoo from that like it was my jam I mean yes I read it over a decade ago uh, but I really enjoyed that series and so I was expecting to really enjoy this as well but my biggest gripe and complaint about the House of Night series is that I always felt like they stretched out what could have been like a five or a six book series into 12 books and because of that the books just kind of meandered and plots didn't really make a whole lot of sense and like so I enjoyed the characters but just things didn't really make a whole lot of sense sometimes with like how much time was put in between things and all this that and the other and Spells Trouble is exactly the same. Um, I liked some of the plot and I liked kind of where things were going and I didn't dislike the characters but I had one major one glaringly obvious issue and that was that 95% of this book reads like lower YA to mid grade like not a whole lot happens that's I mean they're teenagers they're not like speaking explicitly they're just kind of like trying to save the world it has like that 
you know when you read like a really good mid-grade that has like the the, the feels of a mid-grade like it had a lot of that the other five percent was an explicit sex scene and I don't know how that makes any fucking sense like a what is it doing in a YA in the first place I mean yes teens have sex that's fine I mean I get that aspect of it and it's fine but when the rest of the tone of your book reads more like mid-grade or lower YA there should not be an explicit sex scene in the book because like for the majority of that I think that like that book I could tear those pages out and hand that to like my 10 or 12 year old nieces and they would love the book but I'd have to tear that part out. Like they would, it would make sense to them. It would be a story that would make sense to them at their time in their life. And it would be words they understood. And like, it would be a good book for them. But there's an explicit sex scene for some reason, like smack in the middle of the book that really pissed me off. Um, it made me very angry because it's not what I was expecting and not what, not what I was expecting because of the contents of the rest of the book. Not because it was YA, because again, teens have sex. I understand sex in YA. I don't like to read it because I'm old and it's creepy but that's my choice because I tend to read YA and that, that's a whole other thing for a whole other day but it was weird and it didn't make any sense and the other thing is that it again meanders there's not a whole lot going on it just and nothing got solved at the end of it and I'm not continuing on with the series um moving on spoiler alert by Olivia Dade I DNF'd I had an arc of the second book so I was like probably ought to read the first book um, yeah, I DNF'd it. I, I, no, I expected to love it. It was like fan fiction and plus size women like getting to date their like hottie, hunky celebrity crushes. Like that sounds fantastic. But it was just lying on top of lying with a side of lying with lying for dessert. There was just so much lying going on and things that did not make any sense. And the main character's best friend, who is the main character of the second book, is a total douche nozzle and I have no interest in reading about him. And I DNF'd it and I walked away and I'm much happier for that. The Orphan Witch by Paige Crutcher, also an arc. It was boring. I didn't like it. I expected it to be great because like witch book. I love witch books. The cover is fucking gorgeous. And I was bored as fuck. It didn't make any sense. I'm not sure how anything happened. The love story was boring as fuck. Like you knew the second that the love interest walked on the page that he was going to be endgame and you knew exactly what was going to happen. I knew that the evil person was the evil person the second I met them. Like it was very predictable and very boring. The Project by Courtney Summers. I expected this to be a five star. It revolves around a cult. It revolves around sisters. I expected to love this. Instead, I got a sister who made no fucking sense to the choices that she made in her life, and I kind of want to drown her in a river. If you've read the book, you'll get that reference. The Woods Are Always Watching by Stephanie Perkins. We're not going to talk about it other than to say it was probably my lowest rated book of the year, and I only finished reading it because it made for a great spoilery review and I will link that in the description box down for you if you would like to check it out. It was a terrible book and I hated it and I wish I could take those six hours of my life back. These Violent Delights by Chloe Gong. Again, I've already unhauled it. I think I tried to read that in January. DNF'd it. Didn't like it. It's a Romeo and Juliet retelling which I'm not a huge fan of Romeo and Juliet anyway but the thing that just like made me walk the fuck out the door was at the very beginning of the book it's like the end of chapter four so it's not a spoiler um you've got Juliet who is like the heir to the throne of one side of the mafia and Roma who's the heir to the throne of the other side of the mafia and Roma's father wants them to work together on a project to try to like solve this thing that's going on in the city and he's like well you were lovers once like you should just use that to convince her to help you out and I'm like dude they are 17 and 18 years old she hasn't even been in the fucking country for four years so what you're telling me is that they were in love when they were 13 and 14 and that is the linchpin for your entire plan to make any fucking sense I'm out like 13 and 14 year olds in love and that being the linchpin of this whole entire book no no thank you I'm out and the last book on this list is actually a 2022 release that I read it this year and that is When You Get the Chance by Emma Lord. I have read two other books by Emma Lord previously and that I have loved. I love the way she mixes like her YA drama with the adults drama. This book is like a Mamma Mia retelling of sorts and I hated the main character. 
Um, I, she, not enough character growth in the world could make me love that girl. I hated her. Um, she was not fun to read from. She was very neurotic. She just was all over the place. She gave two shits about what anyone else thought. Anyone else's feelings did not give a fuck what anyone else thought or felt. And I still think towards the end, she didn't really give a fuck what anybody else thought or felt. Um, she walked all over people to get whatever the fuck she wanted and she did not care. The page that her love interest walks on, the page, you knew that he was the love interest just from the way that they behaved. There was no mystery in that. There was no mystery in anything. It was all very blah. And I hated it and I'm very disappointed that I hated it. I love Emma. I think she's great. I love her previous works. I know that she put her heart and soul into this book and I know that it is very like close and dear to her heart, but I didn't like it. And that's fine because not every book's for everybody. And now we're going to do our favorites of the year. Again, these are not the best books of the year. They are my favorite books of the year. And then there's a difference in that, but uh, let's move on. These are also in alphabetical order uh, by title. A Curse in Ash by Julie Zantopoulos. Julie is a fellow author tuber and I will link her channel in the description box down below for you if you would like to peruse her channel. I highly recommend you do because if you are also a writer or you like to read or do anything productive, she has productivity sprints on Sundays at 8 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. That's a whole other thing for a whole other day, but hello, here we are. I loved this book. Uh, this book is fantastic. It blends like fae magic and also like witchy stuff and like so many aspects of things that I love about fantasy together. It has a poly relationship, a positively presented poly relationship. There were so many things about this book that I loved. I loved the characters. I loved the world building. I loved the plot and the story and those the way that everything worked together. There is like a major cliffhanger ending that killed me. I'm very unhappy about that, Julie, in case you're wondering. Um, I'm going to need that to be resolved very soon. Like, as soon as possible. Thank you. Next is All the Impossible Things by Lindsay Lackey. That sounds right. There's a cover somewhere on the screen for you to peruse. Um, this was a mid-grade that I really, really, really enjoyed. Um, I don't think there was a single moment in the first six chapters of this book that I was not crying. And there was definitely more crying at the end. Um, <laughs> the book really um, discusses like the importance of found family, um, letting people go when you are not the right person for them. Just a lot of different aspects about relationships and the way that people connect with one another. It was just a really, really beautiful story that I really enjoyed and uh, at some point I plan to buy a copy to put on my shelves because it's gorgeous um, and I really, really, really enjoyed it. Um, would 100% read it again right now if I had it in front of me. Speaking of really beautiful books that made me cry, next is Amelia Unabridged by Ashley Schumacher. Um, this book. Yeah. So this book deals with um, two best friends. Uh, it's not a spoiler because it's on the synopsis. Deals with two best friends who were in a fight. One of them dies before they've been able to make up. So the other friend has to like figure out how to go on with life. Like not with her friend, you know, has died and she's not been able to make up the fact that they had like this huge knockdown drag out fight. And there's just it's, it revolves around books and what books can mean to people, how they can change your life, how they can really affect you as a person, and not only from the reader's side, but from the writer's side as well, because our main character meets the writer of one of her favorite books, um, and you learn how he was able to write about the things that he wrote about and where he brought those stories from, and it's just beautifully done, and I cannot praise this book enough. It was one of my all-time favorites and also because it's here one of the best books of the year also speaking of books that made me cry oh my god is this is this a requirement uh, blood like magic by lizelle sanbury again who is a fellow author tuber and i will link her channel down below and also i will link the entire i did a reading vlog for this i'll link that as well and you can watch me cry in real time um this book was just absolutely fantastic and beautiful and lovely and had all of those moments again um about relationships and family and the way that people can be important to you and the way that people who you never thought would be important to you are and finding relationships and making communities work and and I think 
you know, as I'm looking at this list, I think one of the things that I have found over this year in these books that I have loved is that really um, seeing communities and families, found families or blood, um, but seeing families and communities and these people come together to try to help one another and to really understand one another is something that I have found incredibly beautiful in all of these books. And so, yes, it's gorgeous. It's beautiful. It's got pink sprayed edges. Outside, beautiful. Inside, fantastic. Magic and just all the things. Sci-fi, magic, history. I just, I, I love this book. I cannot say enough good things about this book. I can't remember if this one made me cry or not, but it probably did. Felix Ever After by Case and Calendar. Oh. So this book is own voices for black, trans, and queer. And it just, it hits so many identities that I do not identify with. And I really feel like while I do believe that these books are written more so for the person that can identify with it and that can see um, themselves in literature as they should be able to as well as in other um, forms of entertainment. It also, when you're not part of those identities, um, if you are, you know, able to see things the way that the world works, um, you can also see that at its core it really is about dealing with being other and I think everybody can feel othered at some point or another despite you know what similarities they might have to um, other groups of people you we've all felt othered at some point or another and that feeling that you can connect to is really what's important and I think this book in particular does a fantastic job of not only showing someone with those identities like um gives them something to connect to, but also for the rest of us, gives us something to a teach us something, teach us a lesson about um, some of the struggles and hardships that these people go through, but also um, the beauty in finding yourself and figuring out who you are, especially when you are in your teens and being able to realize that regardless of whatever you are, whoever you are, what you might be into, what you enjoy, um, you're enough and that you deserve to be loved. And I think this book stated that better than pretty much anything I've read all else this year. Uh, let's move on from the cry fest to a spooky book, uh, House of Hollow by Crystal Sutherland. So if you've been on the channel before, you know that Crystal Sutherland is one of my all-time favorite authors. Her book, Semi Definitive List of Worst Nightmares, is probably my favorite book of all time. I have reread it more times than any one person should have. And I was so fucking hyped for this book and it did not disappoint. It is creepy and spooky and it just, her books always have, even, even um, Our Chemical Hearts has a little bit of like a whimsy element to it. It's not necessarily fantastical in any way, like semi definitive List or this, but it, it definitely has like a bit of whimsy despite the fact that it deals with very heavy topics and makes you want to curl up in a ball and cry. But it does have a like a little bit of whimsy to it. And then uh, semi definitive List was like just like way out left field whimsy. And then this was like a whole other thing, a whole other days. Her books always do deal with a central darker topic and this book did not shy away from that in any way shape or form and I think our characters and just learning about what happened to them over the years and like the the mystery behind like where these girls disappeared to where they went like what had happened just ugh, I can't it's still it's like I had about 50% was fairly certain where the book was going and I was like but she wouldn't do that like nobody's gonna do that nobody has that brain nobody's gonna do that and you'd get like a couple chapters and you'd be like oh, okay so like that that's not gonna happen because this happened and this thing happened and you're like well but maybe but no because then this happened this when the thing that you thought was going to happen is the thing that happened and it still surprises the fuck out of you and gives you the skeebies, oh, it was just so well done and I fucking loved it. I had a great time being creeped out. Next is A Legend Born by Tracy Dion. I read this in January. It is standard, a testament to its time as one of my favorite books of this year. 
I will admit that looking back and having heard other people review it as the year went on, I think it did have larger problems than what I originally seen. And I do plan to reread this before the second book comes out later this year. I still think this is top tier of things that I read this year. It was fantastic. I loved it. The magic, the world building, the relationships between the people, getting to see Brie who is completely othered in this group of people that she is with. Um, she is absolutely not like other girls at least in this situation and getting to see her in this world that she's moved into and just how things are just... It was a ride and I had a fantastic time and I like the twist ending and things that were happening and there's a weird love triangle that's kind of like a quadrangle except there's only three people in it if that makes like the love triangle goes more than one direction and I am thoroughly confused and I don't know what's going to happen and I love it and if you haven't seen the cover for the second book you should look it up because it is fucking gorgeous like even more gorgeous than this and I thought that was going to be hard to beat but it's not really that hard to beat but it's I mean it's like it's great it's fantastic I loved it I cannot wait it's it doesn't come out till November so I have to wait but I don't want to wait remember earlier when I was holding up lore and I said this is not the Medusa book I wanted and I said we'll talk more about Medusa later Medusa by Rosie Hewlett this is literally just called Medusa that's the title um our little subtitle here is Gorgon Killer Monster victim, survivor, protector. Um, you've probably heard me rave about this book this year because I have been screaming about it from the rafters. I love this book. I don't even know how I found this book. I, I might have just been like scrolling through Instagram and they probably heard me bitching about Medusa and they were like, here bitch, take this book. And it's gorgeous for one. I mean, look at that cover. And I was like, all right, I'll buy it. This is like, Medusa telling us what happened to her in her real life but she's in Tartarus telling us about like what happened to her and also the things that she's learned since then and how oftentimes sexual abuse survivors are treated as if they were the perpetrator or as if they are not really a victim we blame our victims we you know blame these women for things that have happened to them and that definitely is what happened in Medusa's case and I have stand on my soapbox that I mean I know she's a fictional character and I know she's not real but Medusa was the original feminist like that bitch you know she stood for a lot of people as far as like um like the the emblem the semblem the the symbolicness of her was I think like a big point to a lot of women in ancient history and so I have always respected that about her I love her I I, I hate her story because of the story of what happened to her but I love that something that people started telling as a story so many eons ago has been changed over time to this really um, dark story about basically a monster who you know just turned people to stone. Most people don't know the origin story of Medusa which is what this is and to me it is so lovely that there's still information out there for us to get the true story of like the original tale of Medusa. Again, I know it's not real. Like the snake-headed lady, I know she's not real, but I appreciate her and whoever originally told her story and what the story spoke about. Okay, this book was fantastic. It made me cry. The ending fucking murdered me and if you read it, you're welcome. Uh, let's talk about a couple that I don't have. Rules for Vanishing by Kate Alice Marshall. <sighs> fucking creepy, loved it. Um, I read this in October during spooky book month. It is super fucking creepy. Like if you want the creepies, this is the book for you, my friends. It is just, ugh, ugh. it's like these friends, they go into this road that only appears like on a specific time. And there's like all these rules you have to follow. And like people try to do this all the time. And most of them don't make it out. Lots of people die. It is fucking crazy wackadoo, kachoo, kachoo, kachoo. And I loved every minute of it. I'm still not sure what happened at some parts and like it definitely is one that deserves a reread because like at like the third act you get to find out that a lot of the things that you've seen that the other characters seen was not what was actually happening. There was other shit going on and you weren't allowed to see what was really happening because magic and so then like retcons a whole bunch of stuff and you're like what the fuck and then you just like blah and it was a fantastic time and I highly recommend. Also, The X-Hex by Aaron Sterling, which is the pen name of Rachel Hawkins, 
whom I love. She is the witch queen of all queens. And so an adult rom-com witchy book was exactly what I was looking for in October. It was fantastic. I absolutely loved it. It was a wonderful time. It was a great book. I cannot say enough good things about it. I love like a second chance romance. I love like the mixing of the real world with the magical world and just how things kind of blended together and the family aspect of it and it was just so good so good and 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 a, a little spicy it was a little spicy and I liked it. Number 23 on books that made me cry this year The Invisible Life of Addie LaRue by B.E. Schwab. If you read this and it doesn't make you cry you do not have a soul much like some people in the book. Uh, this book was fantastic. It was beautiful. It really spoke a lot about the impact that we can have on people without really realizing that we have that impact. I will say that I have um, read some of like people's complaints, um, concerns about the fact that Addie, you know, has been alive for like 400 years and the only places she ever goes are like America and Europe and she doesn't ever go anywhere else and she only ever like hangs out with white people or whatever. I, I after reading it, like have looked at that and I understand where people are coming from, but, and I would probably take a, a larger, closer look at that on a reread. But on my first read, I just, I really just had a good time. Like I was just having a fun time uh, being emotionally distraught by V.E. Schwab. So there's that. Um, I really enjoyed this book. I bought the first anniversary edition because how many books have you ever seen get a one year anniversary edition? Like it was that good and so many people loved it. So it was, it, I had a fantastic time being crushed by this book. And I love the way it ended and I would love, like Victoria, if you're out there somewhere and you're watching this video, we all know that she's not, but if you are, if you're out there and you're watching this video, I would love to see just like a snippet, just like the tiniest snippet of like 50 years later from the end of this book of what's going on. Maybe 100 years, maybe 500. I don't know. I'm not asking you to write a sci-fi. That's too much. Not that it's too much for you because you could do it, but that's, that's a lot of ask for like a snippet. I just want a snippet of like what's going on 50 to 100 years in the future. That's all I want. Like, so if you're out there and, you, and you're feeling like you need to, like, give me a birthday present or something, I don't feel like it's too much to ask for. Like, that's, that's all I want. Okay, moving on. The Love Hypothesis by Allie Hazelwood. This book's been blowing up everywhere and it's on lots of people's favorites. And it's even on some people's most hated, I hated it, why did I ever read it? But I loved this book. In the journey of discovery of life in your mid-30s, as women do, we often discover that we are not the people that we thought we were originally. And previously, earlier this year, I was having a discussion and we've all kind of decided, and by we, I mean me, myself, and I, we've kind of decided that I probably am more demisexual than what I had realized and have, like, in that realize what has kind of gone wrong in a lot of my relationships in the past. You're not here for that conversation. But what it, where that correlates to is our main character in this book is demisexual. And I have never felt so fucking seen in my life. Like, yes, there's a sex scene in this book. Yes, it is weird. But I've never seen that representation on page before. And so seeing it made me feel like I'm maybe not quite as weird as I thought I was, if that makes sense. Like I've always kind of thought that there was just something wrong with me or something like broken in my brain. And this book brought that to a different level and, and actually gave me like the insight that maybe it wasn't just me and that I could look into finding other people like myself if that makes sense so like this was like the book of discovery for me this year like despite the fact that I loved the writing and the rom-comness of it and the the just her <laughs> adamantly being like I can't go to somewhere with you and stay in the same hotel room there will only be one bed because this is a rom-com and he's like no there's two beds I checked she's like but you but there will only be one bed I'll leave it to you to read the book and find out how many beds there were but yeah it was a fantastic book outside of changing my life and my perception of myself. It was a fantastic book on the outside of that, but with that, even better. The Nature of Witches by Rachel Griffin. Witch book. You know we love witch books. So, 
fantastic. It really was the characters for me. It was really the the story of how like this one person can be so important to an entire community of people and how putting the pressure on this one person to perform is kind of the opposite of what you should be doing. And because everyone was putting all of this pressure on her and trying to make her be the person that they all needed her to be she was the exact opposite of that and what it took was one person to come in and be like it's totally fine if you can't do the thing that they all want you to do just you know do your best and and if it's not enough then they'll have to deal with that and the fact that there was like one person who just wanted her to be herself and just wanted her to do what she thought needed to be done and that made her feel better it's like a plus in my opinion. Also there's like this whole chapter about the main character and the love interest having entire communications between themselves with um, flowers and the meaning of different florals and it is one of the most beautiful things that I've ever read in a book in my life. It was just wonderfully done and made me cry. Next is The Night Swim by Megan Golden. I have a full review video for this up like a non-spoiler review. I posted it yesterday. You can go back and watch it from yesterday. This snuck in. This is probably, I think, the last book I read this year. So it snuck right on in there as a favorite of the year. And uh, I got this as part of a blind date with a book. So if you go to yesterday, watch my blind date with a book video, you'll see all of my thoughts, feelings, questions, concerns about this book. I loved it. I think that it was written so incredibly well. Um, it does that thing that I love where the crime book has like multi-year, like there was a a past crime and a present day crime. It did that thing that I love. There was just so many things that I absolutely loved about this book and it was fantastic, wonderful, and I want nothing more than to read more books like this next year. And the last book that we'll talk about this year, again, if you've been on my channel before, you are expecting this to show up, but you knew we were doing this alphabetical, so you knew it would be at the end because you know the alphabet. Witch Shadow by Susan Denner. This is the fifth-ish book in the Witchland series. Um, it depends if you count the novella or not. I don't know. Um, this book was fantastic. I love the series. It makes me so happy. I love the characters, the way that they meet each other, but then are pulled apart from each other, but then they get to meet each other, but then they're pulled apart from each other. And just all of like the drama and the political intrigue and all the things that are happening. The world is ending, the world's on fire, but also there's like this rebirth and these new things and they're trying to get these things together and they're trying to save all these people, but also people are trying to kill all these people. And they're just like reincarnation and just crazy cockatootie patootie patootie stuff going on and it was a fantastic ride. Uh, this one does deal with like multiple timelines uh, because the author was kind of forced by the publisher to put two books together and so um, in order to show everything that she needed to show and to drop all of the crumbs that she needed to drop she ended up having to do like a partial um, dual timeline which uh, didn't have the best execution. It didn't work as great as what I, I think having two separate books would have worked. Theoretically this would not actually be on this list but this list is by emotion not by actual numbers so it's fine. Yeah I, I love this book. I love what Susan has done with this world and with these characters and just the world building and the work that I know she's put into this. I truly truly appreciate it, all of the work that she's done. I feel that way about all authors and I feel bad when I you know as we were talking about disappointments I'm gonna go ahead and put this one down. You know I loved it. I feel bad when I have a disappointment because I feel bad not enjoying a book that I know a writer put a lot of work into um, as a writer like I grasp the concept but also I mean not everything's for everyone. So that's it. That's all I have. This is going to be like a three hour video. I hope you guys enjoyed it. Um, if you have any comments, questions, or concerns about any of the books that we talked about today um, there'll be a bunch of links for you down below. Otherwise that is all I have for today. I post reading, writing, book, and planner related videos a couple of times a week. If you don't want to miss anything I have going in the future, make sure you hit the subscribe button and the notification bell down below. And until then, I will see you guys next time. Bye!